Could the king be thinking about abdication already? Will William need to make more engagements in 2024? And what will the royal family do about Prince Andrew? We're back with another pack show for you. Hello and welcome to the first proper episode of Palace Confidential for 2024. We are thrilled you could join us. Joining me today is the Daily Mail's editor at large, Richard Kay, royal correspondent and broadcaster Victoria Murphy, and of course, the Daily Mail's diary editor, Richard Eden. Welcome to you all. Now, a reminder before we kick off that for more great royal videos throughout the year, click the subscribe button on our channel. Now, we are biased, but we think watching more Palace Confidential is a great New Year's resolution for everyone. We may be biased, but that doesn't mean it's not true. So let's start things off this week by wishing a very happy birthday to the Princess of Wales, who turned a youthful 42 this week. Gosh, can't even remember 42. Rebecca English, who can't be with us today as she's hanging out with the Prince of Wales, as per, wrote this week that Catherine is now in line for two honours. They are the Order of the Garter and the ability to issue royal warrants. Victoria Murphy, for those of us who don't know what they are, can you please play the teacher for us this fine day? I will, I Thank can. You. Well, they're very different. So I'll start with the Order of the Garter. Um, it's basically a very exclusive club. It's the oldest and most senior order of chivalry in the UK. It was set up by King Edward III in 1348, so a very long time ago. A lot has changed since then, but there are still lots of elements of it that remain the same. And historically, it was like a lot of things connected to the monarchy, the privilege of the aristocracy to be a member of this. But now it's very much something that is appointed to people who have um, uh, distinguished public service. So you have former prime ministers in there, you have uh, former politicians, former sports people. There are 24 knights and there are also royal knights in addition to that. And when we talk about Order of the Garter, I think a lot of people think of the ceremony which is held annually in June where they wear those big plumed, very distinctive plumed hats. Well, I think of garters. Right, yeah. okay. <laughs> That's why I'm confused. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they wear, they wear these um, hats with white, white feathers on, very distinctive. And they process to St George's Chapel in Windsor and the royal family, many members of the royal family are in the Order of the Garter. And Kate has watched Prince William make that procession many times she could very well be appointed by the king. Camilla was appointed by the late queen in 2022. Um, so it's very, very much possibility that Kate could join But that, that would mean Catherine couldn't laugh at Prince William. I know, she did we, laugh at him We've once, seen yeah. her always sort of giggling us, um, you know, with him with his, his plumes and finery. So she'll have to wear the same thing. Yeah. Oh, it's nice to see William with a bit of fluff on top. <laughs> after losing his hair, don't you think? Yeah. Uh, shall I talk about royal warrants? Yes, yeah, please. I'll keep this one brief. So uh, most people have heard of royal warrants. Um, they are appointed to businesses who provide goods or services to members of the royal family. And a member who can appoint royal warrants can decide to, it's like official endorsement of that business or service. And they're allowed to then use the royal coat of arms in understandably limited ways to um, on their business as well. Very, um, a huge deal for any business to be given a royal warrant. Royal warrant granters are the people who can grant those warrants. And at the moment, King Charles is the only living royal warrant granter because the people who were previously granters have died, um, Queen Elizabeth, Prince Philip and the Queen Mother. Um, so there is a sort of gap there, I guess, for more royal warrant granters should the king wish to appoint other members of his family. And do you think we could warrants? have a royal warrant for Palace Confidential? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Give it, you know, give it a bit of time. You didn't have to say no that quickly, Victoria. I was thinking, just, is, is it a goods or service? Is it a service? Oh, it's a service. That's an absolutely. Maybe. It's, it's a good service. Excuse me. <laughs> okay. Moving on, Richard Kay. Now, some people might be surprised that she doesn't, that Catherine doesn't already have those honours. It's a reminder, isn't it, that the royal family kind of go at their very own unique pace. They go at a very much of a snail's pace <laughs> in these things. And there's been an awful lot to sort out because uh, Queen Elizabeth had so many uh, warrants. How many of those is the king going to carry on? How many might he pass on? And, and there's a lot, uh, simply a lot to uh, organise before. She and it will, in fact, it almost certainly will be in William's name. It'll be the Prince of Wales, I suspect, and she'll have some through him or the Prince and Princess of Wales. Mm. Um, and uh, and also, we're expecting the Queen, of course, to be uh, 
having her own list of uh, warrant holders too. So it's it's more about taking ownership of existing warrants than than well, awarding a load po- of new ones. Possibly, but I mean they won't want all, he he won't want all the ones that his mother had, and there'll be things that he simply won't want to be connected to, mm. um, and there'll be others that he will want to to introduce, but. It is a slow process, and it's it's a huge honour, as, as Victoria said, for the firms concerned because they can promote it, and it's jolly good for business. Mm, indeed. Well, we'll stick around later for some great pictures of Catherine in the program. But sticking with the Waleses now, and after some speculation in December, we discussed the number of engagements undertaken by the royals last year, and we now have the definitive list. And one that might surprise people is that the 79-year-old Duke of Gloucester carried out more official events than both the Prince and Princess of Wales in 2023. Richard Eden, in defence of the Waleses on this matter, it it has been a year of upheaval, hasn't it, for them both? Um, It certainly has. You know, it's the year that they've become the Prince and Princess of Wales. I think these, um, yeah, these kind of lists do bring out the the mischief (laughs) in me. We all love them, you know, comparing how hard they work and this sort of thing. And it's it's actually a a sort of devoted um, watcher of the royal family. I think it's Tim O'Donovan reads The Times and each year he compiles this list from the court circular, the official list of duties. And as we know, Prince Harry has talked about how um, the royal family is actually quietly obsessed with them. They pretend not to be, but they want to be at the top. Mm. But what we have seen, yes, is that William and Catherine were quite low down. You know, they came below um, the king, below Princess Anne, below Prince Edward and Sophie. But I think that's fine with them. They that that's part of really what they want to do. That they're trying to do um, fewer engagements and fewer causes, but really get stuck in. So they think it's. Um, much more useful to be um, heavily involved and try and make a difference with fewer projects than be patron of loads, say, um, Prince Richard, Duke of Gloucester, you know, might be patron of lots of charities and just make the odd appearance, that they're taking a different view and that's something that they'll carry into the future. Is is that fair to say, well, let the old man take it all on? Is that... Um, I mean, per- personally, it's, it's not what I'd like to see. I'd like to see more members of the royal family and more engagement. I think that's mm. great for the public to meet members of the royal family and it's good for the monarchy generally. But William and Catherine do have a different view and they um, see um, the future differently. So, you know, that this is a, an outcome of that. What, what do you think, Victoria, if Catherine does need to be at home more for the family? She, you know, very hands-on with things like the school run and that's, I think most people would think that was reasonable. But is it fair to say that the king or palace officials would like to see William getting out on the road more as a result. Well, I think that Rich is right that the um, Welses have a very distinctive approach to the way that they do things, but there is no doubt that there's fewer working royals than there were a few years ago, and it's very important that all of the senior working royals are very visible and are out there. And William does as well as the charities that he's very heavily involved with. And behind the scenes as well, we have to recognise that I think that the Welses do do a lot behind the scenes with their convening power. Um, But he also, William, has for the past few years now stepped up and done things like investitures as well. Um, And I think that will that will continue very much that will continue. Um, But I also think, you know, that monarchy is designed to sort of shore up the person in the top job. You know, it's a hierarchical system. And while I think the King does want William and Kate, William and Catherine to be very busy and visible. He also, I think, wants to be on the front foot with certain things. So, for example, visiting Commonwealth realms. He wants to go there before he sends his heir to these countries. And I think that is influencing in some ways the rhythm of what is happening now since he came to the throne and the the way that timetables are functioning. Mm. Do you foresee, Richard Kay, any conflict arising over the differences in the strategies for the Waleses and... Uh, William's father. Well, I think on one on one to one line they're absolutely twinned, and that's on quality over quantity. Um, they would rather both the king and and William uh, want to do things in a, in a slightly different way, um, rather than as was done under the late queen, where she sent out myriad members of the royal family to to cover as wide a number of engagements and and uh, interests as possible. That's simply ending. There's no question, and then we won't be going back to, to that. Mm. Um, and I think for the time being, at least, it's one of the rare areas where William and his father have some sort of agreement. Mm. Um, 
Uh, William, as Richard was saying, does not want to be constantly opening things that he's not really interested in. Um, and I don't think we're going to see other people drafted in to do those things which were done by the late Queen or indeed by Prince Philip. They'll take the core interests that um, they had before, but they won't expand them. We will just have uh, fewer royals doing fewer things. Well, Richard Eden, you raised the prospect of something that really would be a turn up for the books at the moment. In your royal newsletter last week, a few jaws were dropped at the idea of you discussing the possibility that the king might abdicate. Um, this was in the context of Queen Margaret of Denmark, who next week will... He's always causing <laughs> drama. <laughs> he will hand out, um, she will hand over um, the throne to her son, Prince Frederick. And she's done that because she's of an age. I think she's 83. Um, she's had some health problems. She's had major back surgery. And she would rather hand over to her younger heir. And I was just making the point that in the past, abdication has been a, a real dirty word in the royal family. But it needn't be. You know, we're a mature democracy. I think um, that we're um, comfortable with the monarchy. It's very secure. Um, and that in the future, not, not obviously now, but some point in the future, if King Charles um, did struggle to carry out his duties, he shouldn't feel um, shy about um, abdicating, taking, following the example of Queen Margaret. Do you think, Richard Kay, I mean, obviously abdication is a word that is long associated with the royal family, particularly the British royal family and, and our history here, but is it, would the A word ever be used actually within the royal family? Well, it was a dirty word uh, through all those years when Queen Elizabeth was on the throne and because of her direct relationship to what happened in 1936, the abdication of her uncle, um, and how it affected her father and her mother. It, it sort of clouded, if you not, well not clouded, but certainly it was a, a shadow in the background of her throughout her reign. Charles is one generation removed from that. I don't think he has the same attitude. Um, he has not made the, uh, the assertion that, that his mother made at age 21, you know, that she would go on and on forever and ever as long mm. as she can. Um, I think he's much more realistic about what he can do and the limits that the body might have on him in, in future years. And I think Richard is right. I think it, it is quite possible that at a certain date he might decide to stand down if it's in the interest of the long term of the monarchy. We were talking earlier and I thought it was really interesting, Victoria, you saying that, you know, there's always been this thread running through the royal family of feeling like it's the position is ordained by God. Mm. And that was certainly the Queen's belief. Do you think that Charles has the same view. I don't know what exactly his view was on that point, but I think perhaps, as Richard says, there is the capacity now for a more pragmatic approach to this idea that it has to be a lifelong job, and that's the only way to look at it. Because I think the tricky thing in this country is that abdication has been associated with instability of the monarchy for so long, so it's sort of more of a stretch to brand it as kind of securing the future. Mm. But that's the way that a lot of monarchies around the world are now looking at it, and that's what we're seeing in Denmark now, happening in Denmark for the first time, this kind of practical approach to, I've done this for a certain amount of time, and now is the right time, and I'm going to make that decision. And so I certainly wouldn't rule it out as something that we could see here in the future. Mm. It's so interesting. Now, speaking of interesting, we've got lots of your comments coming up in just a moment but just quickly Richard back to you for a moment Richard Eden you've spotted that Prince Harry has been recognized with another award he is, he's just <laughs> glittering with trophies it's one great thing about Harry and Meghan moving to California is they seem to be garlanded with awards you know that every now and then there's another one what's this um, one th this one is um, I, I did a double take it's He's going to be joining the Legends of Aviation. Wow. It's an aviation so, Amelia Earhart, the Wright Brothers. <laughs> and yeah. Prince Harry, yeah. Um, now, look, he, he knows how to fly a helicopter. He was a uh, co-pilot in Afghanistan, um, and he also flew lots of training missions. Um, so he can fly, um, but it's not clear why he's being given this award. I think, I mean, frankly, I think it's a bit needy. You know, they get... Um, perhaps the organisers of these award ceremonies know that they'll turn up if they give them an award, but there's something your slightly pathetic about it. It feels like I could get a Michelin star for my spaghetti bolognese then. You know, I can cook, therefore, legend of cooking. One man who might be quite jealous, it has to be said, is Prince Andrew, because if anyone wow. deserves one, it's him. You know, he flew very brave decoy missions in his helicopter in, in the Falklands conflict. And um, 
I, I would say he's probably more worthy of an honour than Prince Harry. Well, we will come to the point of Andrew in just a moment. But first of all, let's hear some of your comments. The first comes from the appropriately named Kai Palace. I hope it might be Key Palace. I hope I'm saying that right. Who wrote after our Christmas episode and check back on that one after this if you missed it. How wonderful Queen Camilla has been this year. A wonderful support for the king and a style icon. Now, if you'll allow us to blow our own trumpet for just a little moment here, here's another comment from that show, and this time from James Keener, who wrote, another Thursday, another Daily Mail, Royals, a fine way to end 2023. Thanks for being there to explain things for us during a momentous time. I look forward to what you talk about next year. Happy New Year, you all. Y'all. Oh, sorry, I got that wrong. You all. Thank you for that lovely message. And we also had a very nice message from Gretel Pepper, who says, thank you to all of you presenting and commentating on this channel. It has been interesting and informative. I do believe the issues around H&M, I think that's Harry and Meghan, not the fast fashion store, have brought the other royals together, bonding them even more so. Happy New Year to all and the best for 2024. Happy New Year to you, James, Gretel and Kai, and to all of you for watching. Please keep commenting. We are delighted to have you here for 2024 and look forward to bringing you the news as it unfolds. So let's kick things off again with what has been one of the biggest news stories in both the UK and the US for the past week, and that is the release of documents relating to the convicted sex traffickers, Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell, and a number of high profile individuals, including Prince Andrew, who we should add denies all the claims made against him. Richard Kay, this week was the one where any questions over Andrew's future were finally decided. I would say so. I mean, uh, one step forward and two steps back constantly for Andrew. We saw him uh, take part in the Sandrium Christmas gathering with Fergie and um, people were saying nice things about the king for allowing his brother to be there. Within days, this tranche of documents has reminded us all of the allegations which are stacked up against him and they're pretty horrendous. We learn nothing new, but the fact that they're all written down in these legal documents is incredibly damaging for him and also for the, uh, for the monarchy. Mm, and as Richard alludes to there, Victoria, the claims are lurid. Um, do we know how Andrew is, is taking it? Well, I mean, they are, but they are, as Richard also said, not new. So I think this has been less dramatic for him and the royal family than, for example, when Virginia Dufresne launched her lawsuit against him. That was a story that really had legs. And this is stuff that we have heard before. Um, I, I think how he's taking it, I mean, his life has changed beyond recognition in the last four years or so. Um, but if, I think the fact that he's still living in the royal lodge is a bit of an indication as to how he's taking it, because... Um, you know, that's the last thing that one of the last things that the royal family could um, that, he, that he could not have that would it's like a hangover from his previous status. Um, and he, he clearly does want to stay there. You know, the fact that he's there shows us that he wants to stay there. And I think it shows us maybe that I interpret that as him finding it quite difficult to accept really that his life has completely changed and things have completely changed for him. Is, do you think Richard Eden? What Victoria is alluding to there is that he's sitting in a room chaining himself to the radiator and not going. I mean, this subject is not going away, is it? Well, you know, his friends, and he still has some friends, they are keen to make the point that, you know, in 2003, he signed a 75-year lease on Royal Lodge. He Not only did he pay a million pounds at the time, but he ploughed all his savings in, the money they'd made from a previous house sale, into renovating it. And he saw it, it was his house for life. It was his family's house. Mm. So, you know, why should he leave over these allegations, which we should make clear are all claims. We're reporting them because they're in court documents. But, you know, lots of them are, are denied. Um, and, you know, people are saying he made a terrible mistake in um, handing over the money, signing that deal um, with one of his accusers, Virginia yeah. um, Jufre. Well, we'll come on to that in a minute. But Richard Kay, there was a report in the Times this week from a source close to the Duke who said that blood is thicker than water and that these news claims would have no impact on his living arrangements. I mean, call me a cynic, is this Andrew's <laughs> friends getting in the defence on the, on the front foot? It certainly looks like he's getting the defence in first, mm. almost boxing the king in, if you like by reminding everybody that he is a member of the royal family, his brother is the king. Um, surely the argument goes they wouldn't throw him out. Well, they may not throw him out, but they would like to create, I'm told, a climate where Andrew himself 
does the right thing. As, as Victoria says, it, it is the last vestige of his former life, this grand house. And its name, Royal Lodge, suggests something small. It's huge. It's a mansion. It's a palace, in fact. Um, and it is a home of a former mon uh, it is a home of former Queen Elizabeth's mm. former childhood home. Um, and there is something that sticks in the craw of the public that, about the Duke of York still having occupancy. But will he be booted out? I'm not entirely sure that he will, um, unless he were to voluntarily say, yeah, OK, I get this. I'll move somewhere more appropriate. And it would take the heat off him to a degree and also on the king. Well, yes, Victoria, the king does risk looking a bit indecisive. And, it, you know, people, a lot of people, I imagine, will want him to act. Well, then there's a question over to what extent he can actually act, because the agreement that Andrew has is the lease agreement is with the Crown Estate. It's not directly with the king. And that's something that Buckingham Palace is uh, quite keen to remind people of, I think, about the situation that Andrew's in. Um, I think to a certain extent, it will depend on public pressure as to what kind of pressure the monarchy sort of wants to apply to Andrew because if this is constantly in the public consciousness and if it becomes a really big sticking point as far as optics go then maybe there will be more pressure applied but if it kind of fades off into the background for a while and people aren't really talking about it maybe Andrew can stay there but you know he could he could just choose of his own accord to to go his family hasn't ostracized him on a personal level they've made it very clear that he's welcome at family events um, but him being in that property is difficult for the monarchy. It's difficult for them and the optics. Um, so he could choose to, to say, OK, I accept. It's the time to leave. And he's not, he's not doing that. Not yet. Uh, there's also, <laughs> isn't there, Richard, even the question of Sarah Ferguson. She's always been very loyal to Andrew and the family. She made it to Christmas at Sandringham this year for the first time in a long time. But as she reportedly is trying to rebuild her media career, that could complicate things, couldn't it? Look, Sarah still lives with Prince Andrew at Royal Lodge. It's big enough to have sort of separate wings. They're still very close. Yes, they're separated. There's always been speculation about whether they would um, get married again. And she's the sort of breadwinner of the family now. So yeah. she's been very busy writing her books, doing all this sort of thing. And I think people, you know, yes, she's a bit tarnished by the association, but people admire her loyalty. And look, this is a woman who, when she divorced Prince Andrew, she got hardly any money, very small settlement. Um, so, you know, there was always that duty to look after her. And she's never said a bad word about the royal family. You know, just give her some credit compared with Harry and Meghan that have, you know, been making a career out of um, saying appalling things. But she has shown loyalty, you know, throughout her life. Mm, it's interesting, isn't it? Richard Kay, there was also an interesting comment from the lawyer Alan Dershowitz, who's a law professor, and he got Virginia Drufray to drop her claim. And he suggested that the late Queen pressured Andrew into settling the case. What, what, what have you made of that? I think um, there was pressure on Andrew to settle. Whether it came from the Queen, I think it's highly unlikely. She was quite elderly by that stage, but she was aware that it was overshadowing uh, what was her a platinum jubilee year. And so there was pressure being pushed, I suspect, by senior courtiers who wanted it basically to go away. And, and that's the whole, if you like, the, the whole problem with the American justice system. Uh, you, if, you, if you pay money, you can get these things to go away. But with Andrew, the, it was never, ever likely to, to be put away in a box and the mm. key locked. The stuff was going to come out at some stage in the future. So Dershowitz made a very good point. But had Andrew gone along with the Dershowitz strategy, he'd have had to appear in court and been questioned. And he would have been asked about things he does not want to talk about. Mm. Absolutely horrible situation. And Victoria, we've talked about the Council of State role for Andrew and Harry before. And it's not a new story. We've got, it's the fourth anniversary, believe it or not, of Mexit, the first anniversary coming up of the publication of Spare. And yet Harry and Andrew are still in the line of succession and both councillors of yeah. state. This seems bizarre. Well, the councillors of state thing is a quirk of the system because it's based on the line of succession. Um, I don't think practically the councillor of state thing will ever really come up and be an issue, but obviously it does seem kind of strange that you've got five councillors of state and three of them are not working royals because Beatrice isn't Can I just say this is a red rag to Richard's ball. It feels very strongly <laughs> I'm getting worked up as we speak. Okay. Yeah. 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 Removing someone from the line of succession is a very 
big deal. And I don't think there's any reason to do that because none of the people who are not working royals in the line of succession are, uh, their, their place is going to go down over time. I don't think it's necessary for them to be removed from the line of succession or that is, you know, it's an incredibly huge thing to do that. Um, so yeah, while you have this system and while you have this, this system with the council of state, that's how it will stay. But practically, I don't think it will have much impact at all. On well, the good stay. news is that our Richard Eden, as ever, has a plan. <laughs> Did you know? And regular viewers will not be surprised to hear that it involves Beatrice and Eugenie. <laughs> well, Elaborate. Look, yes, um, you know, Prince Andrew, Prince Harry may not be called upon um, to represent um, the king in any great hurry. That's true. But it's symbolic and, and it's ridiculous and offensive that they still are councillors of state. And King Charles could remedy this very easily, you know, with a, um, he can ask Parliament to approve their removal and it would, it would be done. It's not an issue at all. Um, what I've said in my newsletter this week is that you know, Prince Andrew is a proud man, and um, yes, he m might accept things like this being stripped of the Council of State role, but in return, perhaps King Charles could say, um, I see a greater role for your daughters. You know, perhaps they could have undertake more royal duties. They've shown that they, they've been excellent whenever they have been asked to do things, and, and they could do more, I think. And I think that would be a really positive way of actually retrieving something from a pretty seedy situation. Do you think Andrew would love that plan or is he too much of a competitive dad? I think he would. I think he'd be proud. He'd still be sad that he was being stripped of the, his own role, but at least he would see that sort of the family is carrying on with that sense of royal duty. Mm. Richard Kay, I just wanted to have a quick word about Princess Anne, the Princess Royal, who definitely <laughs> caught my eye in a very entertaining way this week. She touched down in Sri Lanka for a working visit. And, you know, most royals get some help with the luggage, but not our Anne, not a bit of it. She was carrying all her stuff down the stairs of this plane, which might surprise some, particularly of our American viewers, but I bet you weren't surprised with Not at all, isn't she terrific? <laughs> yeah. Tote bag, handbag, anything festooned with bags, it seemed, as she yeah. came down the steps. No, she, that's typical Princess Anne. Practical, get on with it. She doesn't wait on ceremony. It's a classic example of how she just wants to get on with royal, uh, the royal business, stripped of all the uh, the flummery which other members of the family insist upon. It's fascinating. Long live Anne. I think you know. Don't don't mess with Anne. I always say I love that. Well, from one beloved royal to another, as promised earlier in the show, we have some more beautiful pictures of Catherine, Princess of Wales, to share with you as she turns forty-two years old. So here are forty-two fantastic images. great ones there. I hope you enjoyed them. We'll have another great montage for you next week, of course. My thanks to Victoria and the two Richards and to you for watching. We will see you next time on Palace Confidential. Bye-bye.